There we go. All right. Uh, hey, everybody. How are people doing? Welcome to this week's uh, SAS Doc sessions. Uh, already see uh, some familiar faces. Uh, Elton and Johan there in the, in the chat. Welcome back. Uh, welcome, uh, Mayank, uh, to participate at this uh, this event. Um, yeah, I'm your host for today, Alex Duma, um, CEO and founder of Sastock, uh, freshly shaven head, um, sporting the, uh, the the lockdown look because uh, I couldn't get to the barber. Uh, so you you can uh, obviously notice something different about me from uh, from last week. But uh, we're good to have uh, everybody here. I see I see the people are, are, are starting to join. Uh, as we kick off. So, yeah, uh, what is uh, the SAS Doc Sessions? These are a series of events in the run-up to SAS Doc Remote, which is taking place on June the 10th uh, and 11th. Uh, SAS Doc Remote will be our first online conference, bringing together 3,000 plus uh, SAS founders, uh, executives, uh, and investors from across the globe. So really kind of bringing together the, the global SaaS community and our global SaaS community, uh, you know, at a time where we can't connect in person. Uh, so very excited uh, about that. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll see some of you there at SaaS.remote. Remote. Uh, but in the, in the run up, uh, we've created SaaS sessions to, uh, I guess, kind of uh, run and deliver content that is actionable for our community on a, uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, you know, in the run-up to uh, the event, uh, and especially given the times that you know we're going through, both through the pandemic and a, uh, and a recession, uh, we wanted to give you, you know content that is actionable and very topical, kind of right now to to help everybody out. So we do have uh, five amazing speakers today, five amazing marketers uh, that will be giving you uh, stories and tips uh, to help you get through this, specifically for uh, marketing. Your marketing teams, or if you're marketing yourself, uh, so uh, you know I'm confident that everybody is going to go away uh, with five uh, actionable uh, takeaways that they can apply to themselves, their marketing teams, uh, your your businesses, right? Um, uh, and uh, yeah, excited to really kind of uh, learn, watch and learn from uh, the, these great marketers that we have uh, today. Um, and uh, don't forget, like. It's not just another uh, webinar. It's not even a webinar. Um, you, you know, uh, I think people are getting a bit of webinar fatigue, so we're you, you know spicing it up a little bit uh, by keeping the uh, you know the content format you know short and sharp. Uh, and at the end, we are having some uh, fun, uh, rather randomised uh, networking. Um, and so, once the content is over, you know, hopefully everybody uh, sticks around. Uh, we'll go over to the networking section, which is like there. Uh, and uh, we will all uh, connect randomly with uh, whoever's here uh, and have some conversations and share some stories around, uh, I guess, what people are seeing and doing in, in marketing right now. Uh, so uh, there's going to be some fun there. Uh, it's worth sticking around, uh, uh, perhaps, obviously, just to you know, connect with your peers, uh, but also uh, whoever uh, pairs with me uh, will win a free ticket to SaaStop Remote. Um, so I may not be a super interesting uh, person to, to, to pair with, but there is a, a, a bonus that you, you will get a free ticket to, to SAS on remote. So hopefully that's worth uh, sticking around uh, for uh, as well. Um, so if we see uh, just some uh, house rules, uh, I guess. Um, one is if you look in the reception area, uh, there are, uh, or there's a kind of a, a, a description there around um, you know what uh, what you can do uh, in terms of navigating this platform. We're using Hopin, which will be the same platform that we are using for our uh, SaaS Remote Conference in June. Uh, you're seeing some of the features and functionalities, uh, you know, of this platform here today. Uh, and, and again, in uh, in the main conference, uh, you'll see a lot more uh, demonstrated there for you, whereby we'll be able to have uh, you know stages, uh, multiple sessions of content. Uh, networking, which will be segmented, matchmaking. Um, you'll be able to uh, you know, click on uh, on people and direct message and uh, set up uh, uh, video calls, uh, you know, and have one-to-one -one meetings and so on, and, and the full uh, expo booth for partners. So 
uh, all, all, all pretty powerful, uh, exciting stuff. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll get on with the, uh, the show shortly. Um, just to say, obviously, we have the chat function, which you can see uh, here um, and everybody's kind of using. So I can see Bruno uh, uh, from our, my team here, Elton. Thanks for the comment around the nice haircut. Uh, I see uh, uh, an old friend there, Mike Cullen. Uh, welcome, Mike. Uh, hope things are well in Ireland. Alex Delivet, uh, uh, who uh, is a good friend as well. So, in fact, he's so a lot of familiar faces. So good to see everybody. Good to connect with uh, you. Hopefully, we get to uh, pair with each other in the uh, in the networking session. So, um, uh, so we've got the chat. You can have direct chat messages uh, if, if you want to. Um, and not tell uh, everybody about, uh, I, I guess, kind of your, your questions and what you're doing. Um, but it, it would be good to see some, uh, you know, chat, you know, going on uh, on the left-hand side. Um, I think if you go into the middle on polls, you can see that we've got our first poll running here. Uh, it'd be good to get some information from everyone. So the question is, what marketing channels are working best for you right now? Um, so, uh, yeah, have a go at that poll. There will be another one uh, coming on uh, uh, in a bit as well. Um, and, and, yeah, to enjoy uh, today, uh, I will bring on our first speaker, um, who is uh, uh, the CMO uh, at Drift, uh, the recently uh, appointed CMO uh, over, over the last sort of few months, um, and has a great CV in that she was the CMO at Checker, uh, and also the CMO of Salesforce Canada. Um, so uh, with that, uh, we will have our, our first talk uh, with, uh, with Tricia Gelman. Uh, she's the CMO at Drift, uh, and it will be around maximizing the digital, how to rethink your marketing mix in the digital age. So let's welcome uh, Tricia to the main stage. Let's see, I'm sure she'll be joining us uh, shortly. All right, well, what, well, we'll see Trisha when she, uh, uh, when she joins in. Um, here we go. Hey there. Hey, how, how are we doing? Good, um, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Was having a little bit of a technical difficulty between watching the live session and becoming a presenter, but here I am and I can hear you and it's all working. Awesome, no, good stuff. Look, I mean, we're all uh, we're all pretty new to the online, uh, you know, conference uh, game as such, and uh, yeah, we're we're getting uh, you know familiar uh, with the with the tech and, and what we need to do. Um, and uh, I'm, we're in, I guess, this education and learning sort of period, uh, whereby you know, I'm sure by the time Assassin Remote, we'll be masters of the tech, and uh, everybody else will be. Uh, um, uh, pretty au fait uh, in, in how online conferences work. You guys recently just did an online event, right, which was had uh, 10, 12,000 people, 10, something like that? Yeah, we had 9,000 people register for the Rev Summit, and it was so successful that we're looking to continue to do this as an ongoing part of our marketing mix. Amazing. Do you, do you think you'll do that in place of in-person uh, events or uh, a bit of a hybrid? I mean, I think virtual events are going to be with us forever. I think these platforms are evolving really fast. This hop-in platform seems great. And uh, and I think we'll start to do a mix of events. I think it'll be a while before people want to get together in our typical signature hyper-growth events, which is something that Drift is known for. And we have, at those events, somewhere between 2,000 to 5,000 people attend. And I just don't think people are going to want to do that. We were supposed to be doing one of those events in London um, just two weeks ago. And unfortunately, we we decided just to cancel it. Originally, we had pushed it out to September. But, you know, everything is just so uncertain with large in-person events. I yeah. think the thing we'll start to do eventually, I don't know when, is um, more of our smaller community get-together events where it may be prospects, it may be customers, but we're getting together in groups of 20 to 50. And really talking about topics and and sharing amongst the community and building that community of, of connection. And I think that's something that everybody is really craving. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit in you know my slides, but people really want to learn and grow. And this time has really shown us that you know this idea of community and how we can support each other is very strong, probably stronger than any of us ever thought. Yeah. And that's really, I think, what's been helping us get through this time in, in a really great way as marketers. 
Amazing, amazing. Well, with, with that, Trisha, I'm, I'm going to leave and uh, leave you uh, on stage. Uh, I'll be back in uh, uh, nine minutes and 59 seconds, uh, sort of roughly, and looking forward to uh, your talk. So uh, over to you. Okay, great. So let's see if I can share my screen. So today I want to talk to you about um, what it means to maximize your digital and rethink your marketing mix. The, the point here is that we're all um, figuring out how to deal in this time of crisis. And I think we've evolved past the survival mode into the thrive and, and start to grow mode in terms of how we think about our, our marketing mixes. And the fact is that you know none of us are trained specifically in how to do marketing in a time of crisis. But what we know is that, you know, the thing that has made marketers and sales great is that having a sense of empathy and being agile has not changed. So if you're thinking, oh, I'm still struggling here in this time of crisis, I don't know what to do. You have a bunch of this toolkit already in your skill set. Um, and I think one of the great things that's come out of this time is that people have really started to lead with a sense of empathy. And I know that from the planning and the work that we did as a team at Drift, we've really um, taken advantage of the fact that we're doing integrated campaigns where we know exactly where we're putting our spend and, and we're able to move in an agile way. The fact of the matter is that no matter who you are, you have always had your website and your website has now become even more important than ever before. And so what I want to talk to you about is, you know, in your new marketing mix, how can you really think about doubling down on digital? Digital is the thing that we have. And in just that short conversation, we talked about how events will change in the future. I think we all miss um, the true networking and connectivity. And it's great today that we can use um, the Hopin platform to network and to even have an, a little bit of an expo. But, you know, what we really want is to have this, this mix. But right now we have digital. So what I want to talk to you about is some plays that we've been um, investing in that are really working and that we think that you should consider when, when you're looking at what you're doing with your marketing mix today. So one of the key things that we've done and that we've seen, and I've spoken to lots of other CMOs about, is really doubling down on education and building your brand. We're fortunate at Drift that we have a solution for people to help them in the time of doubling down on digital, but everybody is not in the same position. And so what we have done is instead of just canceling all of our events, we have moved to innovating and really thinking differently about how we do our events. We just mentioned Rev Growth. Rev Growth within six weeks, we put together a two day event with about 9,000 people who were registered for that event. And we really thought differently about the length of the content, the types of the content, um, and now we're moving on to do virtual experiences. Today, I'm participating in a 30-person get-together, which is replacing our former regional dinners and get-together events. And in that, we're not just having a conversation, but we are actually doing a, an, a wine tasting. We sent people wine, and we have an expert who's going to walk people through the tasting of that wine and the understanding of it. So really using this time to build brand and to build connection and experiences. The other thing that we did is we doubled down on um, community. We have the Drift community and we've been using that to help people connect, to share their best practices. Um, and we've really been engaging in that community, which is a mix of you know, people who don't use our products at all. Um, we just want to help people understand how to be the best marketers during this time. And the third thing here is video. We're all using more and more video connectivity. We're doing this event here today over video. Um, and we've seen that video is not only a good way to do events, but it's a great way to do prospecting and a great way to connect as marketers. And so doing short videos that you can post in social, doing short videos that you can share in email, people are really engaging in video. And that brings me to the fourth point, which is content marketing really using content as a way to help you build your brand. If nothing else during this time, you can build your brand. You can transform how people think about your brand and you can build up that top of funnel engagement with a community of people that are hopefully in the future when budget and resources unlock, able to invest with you. 
And so then, of course, you um, have the opportunity, depending on your financial situation in your company, to invest across the entire um, digital marketing mix. But one thing to not uh, forget is email marketing. I think all of us have probably invested in some level of email marketing platform. And in there, you have a database and trove of people that you have the ability to connect with. And it's our recommendation that you think about how you can connect with those people in entirely new ways. Now, as you think about building your brand and building um, engaging content, I think the important thing that we're starting to see is you know, the world is really noisy and people have lots of choices as they sit at home in their living rooms engaging with your content. And so you need to think about how you can personalize your digital experiences. And this is becoming more and more important. The other thing is that we've seen a surge in people doing um, what I call targeted marketing, what other people call a company's marketing. You know, if you have limited budgets, this is a great way for you to think about how can you personalize your message to the right people by bringing together all of your um, your platforms, whether that's your marketing automation platform, your web analytics, your, um, you know, products related to uh, execution of ABM, making sure that you have information and data on people to bring that together is uh, immensely important at this time. And, and the other thing that we're seeing and the new re reports were just published yesterday is that a lot of people don't have phone systems where they're able to take their business phone and forward it to their cell phone. And so there are a lot of cold calls that are being made or follow ups from forms that are going directly into voicemails that, you know, really cannot be accessed by people. And so you need to think about in your digital, how are you not just building that content? How are you not just getting people there? But how do you engage with people? How do you engage with them, understanding who they are, what they want, where they are in your marketing mix, and why they're engaging with you? And so I want to leave you with a couple of um, quick wins that we've seen as sort of great best practices to think about here. And one of our mantras is recycle and reuse. In this time of crisis, it's important to simplify, to focus, and to repeat the things that you see that are working. And unlike other times, you need to reevaluate what are the things that are working probably every two weeks at a minimum. But one of the things that we've seen is that if we go back again into our email database, into the database of people that we have, we can run different plays to help us win and to connect in, in new ways with people. So going back to opportunities that were lost, now is a great time to go back to those opportunities. We have found that people who were sitting on the fence, unsure about what, what they wanted to do six months ago, are interested in engaging. In some cases, people have more time than ever to move into evaluation on your solution. So going after those people with your targeted digital and with your email programs, understanding where people are in that mix um, is very important. The other is win back campaigns, people who were closed lost um, and people who, um, you know, have engaged with you in the past, but, you know, you just never won them. And then re-engagement campaigns, making sure that you are re-engaging and you're make, and going through and really taking a hard look at your segmentation of your lists, at understanding who is in your list and, and looking at what content you can to deliver to them in a very relevant way. So potentially segmenting by industry and building new content by industry or size of business, depending on how you go to market, you know, that is something that's great to do. And then finally, um, I think one of the things that's been really exciting right now is that there's been a renewed focus on customers. So how, as a marketer, can you use your digital mix to not just try to drive new business, but to go back to your customers, to engage and build an exciting and delighting experience for your customers, to ensure that your customers are really onboarding, that they're moving into that phase of being delighted with your solution, and maybe even connecting with other customers back to that message about community. And what we found is that, you know, engaging and doubling down with our customers is really making a big difference. Um, marketing playing a bigger role in assisting the customer success organization um, is a really strategic way to use your time and energy right now. And um, this is something that we, as well as virtual events, will continue to do in the future. So this is my advice for you. And um, 
it's great, uh, good timing, I guess, because here's Alex again to pull the hook and pull me off the stage. I would love to continue the conversation with you about how you are doubling down on digital and where you're seeing success. And the best way to do that is to reach out to me in LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn every single day. And I hope that we can continue this conversation in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tricia. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, I mean, I, I said at the beginning that we will uh, ensure that everybody that's attending will, will get at least five takeaways, you know, from, from this entire event. Uh, but I think we got more than five uh, uh, just from your talk alone. So, 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 so that, that was fantastic. And uh, I like the, uh, the 30 person get togethers um, uh, with, the, with this virtual wine tasting. I didn't yet receive my bottle of wine, uh, but I'm sure it's on the way. Um, we'll save on the next one. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're doing this today and we're doing it as a regular occurrence. And um, it's actually become an interesting thing because, for example, today I, I sent a note to our event person to remind all of the people who registered that they should put their bottle of white wine in the fridge so that when we go to taste that in four hours, that it's actually chilled. And so one of the things about the digital world that I think we're seeing, and you've probably seen with this event, is it's not just about getting people to register, it's about getting them to show up. And this virtual wine experience is actually proving to have multiple touch points that make it great to get people to show up. So I'll report back to you later in terms of how many people like the wine and how the wine actually helped to get people to engage and have a high attendance rate. Awesome. Well, looking forward to hearing that. Um, sounds like my kind of events. Uh, <laughs> uh, good stuff. All right. Well, uh, Tricia, thanks so much. Um, and uh, I think you just need to... Uh, I think press leave and we'll uh, we'll welcome on to the uh, the next guest. But thanks so much, uh, Trisha Girl. Thanks so much. Bye. Cheers. Okay, and so coming up now, I know we're a couple of minutes uh, over time, but uh, I hope you'll forgive us. Um, uh, we have uh, the CEO and co-founder of Lendlist, uh, Guillaume uh, Mobesh, or uh, easier to say, uh, G. Uh, and hey, Alex. Hey, you all right? <laughs> I'm great. What about you? I love the new haircuts. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. You not considered uh, getting one as well? Um, uh, I should. I should. <laughs> I feel like uh, I'm setting a trend, even though. I'm not. Um, well, good. You're going to be talking about uh, how to find the best topics to write about uh, in a time of crisis. So, uh, I'll leave it to you to introduce yourself, and then I'll be back in uh, in, in ten minutes. Yeah, definitely. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Guillaume Moubesh. I'm the CEO and co-founder of uh, Lemlist. If you have questions, feel free to ask them directly in the chat because I'll be happy to come back later on and answer everything. Uh, my goal essentially today is to is to show you really like actionable tips of things we've done at Lemlist um, to really like uh, leverage basically like the, um, the, the crisis and really be able to 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 leverage it to get like uh, definitely like tons of uh, of views and customers engagement so i'm gonna jump straight to it um can you please let me know yeah if you can see i think it should be working so quick intro ceo of lemlist uh, i'm french as you can probably see so when trisha mentioned wine i was like really really happy <laughs> um we have like ten thousand plus customers worldwide and we're a bootstrap company so no funding and we reached uh, 1 million ARR in less than two years so the plan for today is really like um, to understand the pain of your customers in a time of crisis so we'll see like uh, actionable techniques on how to do that the second part will be how to get in touch with your customers but make sure that they reply so we will see like creative way of getting in touch with them in order for you to get tons of really cool insights. And finally, I will uh, reveal our secret framework when it comes to writing good content and having like the perfect distribution, helping you to stand out and get like uh, a, a really like full pipe uh, of leads. So the first part, uh, I, I'd love to do that, which is essentially like normal times versus the crisis. So in normal time, obviously it's important to understand your user's pain. However, during a crisis, it's really, really important. Uh, I know it sounds dumb, but it's, it's really like the part where empathy is gonna take into action. Trisa talked about it a, a little bit, but I will come back to that later as well. So in a normal time also, you're gonna tend to showcase your product and service uh, when there is like um, an issue or a problem your customers are facing. However, during a crisis, uh, I think it's a time to really build on your brand, really build on the customer experience. And it's okay to give uh, free things to people that have been affected because it shows empathy and it shows that you're 
a real human being and not just you know tr someone trying to to run a business and trying to to make money out of people so i think that's really really important and finally in normal times your goal is really to convert whereas during a cry think, uh, crisis sorry i think your goal is going to be to really like fill in the pipe so create opportunities build relationship because you know that eventually when everything goes back to normal it's going to be um, it, everything's going to be like uh, fine and people will remember you which means that your user acquisition will be basically like boosted. So use Google. I know it sounds dumb, but it's really like the best way to, to get like um, to get like tons of insights. So for example, here, I know that um, a lot of people lost their jobs uh, during like COVID. So I wanted to know what people wrote about. And then I, I started like seeing articles. So that gave me like the idea of what articles were ranking the best, then also how people were structuring that their, their articles. And finally, you can see that uh, our article that we just wrote was actually like ranking on the first page, which uh, gave us like tons of, uh, of visibility as well. Places like Quora are amazing because people are always asking questions over there. So you can find really like tons of discussions when it comes to the crisis, et cetera, and, and leverage it to get ideas for your content. Finally, you can use LinkedIn. So post on your LinkedIn, try to get in touch with your existing customers, user, audience, et cetera, to know what's up with them, what are they trying to look for, and really like get insights from them because that's exactly what you want to know. So the second part is asking questions. So in order to get to know uh, what content will work the best, you need to ask the right question. Um, to do that, customer interviews are simply amazing. We know that we're in a time of crisis, which means that a lot of people are actually, you know, at home and have a bit more time. So sending them emails uh, in order to get in touch with them works really great. So here, for example, it's a campaign that I launched where I asked, so my subject line was either help or can you please help us first name? Uh, the one with uh, the first name worked uh, a bit better. We had like, uh, I think it was like 75% on the left and 85% uh, open rate on the right. Finally, like we used uh, personalized images to stand out. So as you can see, like um, we had like the, the, so the gray circle here is to have a dynamic logo. So based on the person we reached out, they had their logo on it. And finally, like the, the first name was replaced by their first name in order to make it personalized. And I think Trisha mentioned it, but we're also like huge fan of videos at Lemlist. So we use that with a person with a video for, for a person explaining that I wanted to help them. So help my customers during the, the crisis, uh, try to understand what were their current challenges and really get to know them, get to know their point, their pain points. And these sessions that I ran where I got like uh, maybe 50 people, uh, 50 calls organized. I learned so much and I was able to really help our customers out, which in some cases generated actually like a, an increase of revenue through upsell. And in many other cases, just building relationship and strengthening the relationship with customers. So I think it's a it's a win win in any case. I saw a lot of people actually trying to run away from their customers, especially in SaaS, because they were like, OK, they haven't canceled yet. So I think I'm not going to disturb them, etc. As if, you know, they were scared to talk to your customers, but actually don't be. Uh, go through to your customers, get a lot of insight, get to know like what their challenges are, because you'll be able to leverage this in your content and also in your sales prospecting as well. So um, as you can see here, yeah, I use like tactics to grab attention. So videos usually work really best. Click rate here on this campaign is like 70%. So that's, uh, that's usually huge. Communities, whether it's Facebook, Slack, et cetera, are also awesome. So you can run like uh, polls. So here, for example, it's a poll we run in our community on Facebook and you see the engagement. It's like hundreds of people are, are commenting, which I think is great. Uh, and the final part, which is going to be like the content creation and uh, the distribution. So here I'm going to share with you my uh, our secret. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the LEM Air content policy, which is our secret framework. So LEM Air, what does that sound for? Uh, L is for likable. E for empathetic, M monumental, A actionable, I inspiring, R result oriented. So likable, uh, essentially it's basically, does it have our brand character? It's super important that from customer support up to the content we write, we keep it really like um, um, with the branding on top of everything. Empathetic is super important in a time of crisis because it shows that you really understand the pain of your users and you want to help them. Monumental, 
I think it's something that's really also like uh, as part of the tricky for me element, which is how does it help really like the business? Uh, it's also linked to the next point, which is actionable. Uh, I see a lot of content out there. I think Trisha again mentioned it, like you have a lot of noise when it comes to content. So make sure that your content is actionable, meaning that people will be able to do something out of it. Uh, finally, inspiring. I think it's always nice. It's part of the storytelling. What makes people read is they need to get inspired. And finally, result oriented. Like I know a lot of companies do, don't do that because I think it's difficult for them when they when they become like really big to put actionable and result oriented things where they share experiments. But for me, as a content reader and as a practitioner, I love to share all the results that we do, all the things, all the tests that we run at Lemlist and really showcase from A to Z the processes and what's working. And for us, it's really our top performing content and the one that are bringing the most customers. Uh, so here, likable, uh, my tone and our tone at Lemlist is really like to make jokes, have fun, etc. So here in the article I wrote to help people find jobs, I was essentially like um, making a joke when I mentioned Lemlist. So obviously I gave a super nice description of our product and I mentioned that since I was a CEO, it was a little bit biased, obviously, which I think like people kind of enjoyed. Um, the, thing, the second part is empathetic. So in the, in the article I wrote, we got like uh, tens of thousands of views, uh, basically like in the first week. It's basically like um, I noticed that a lot of people uh, got fired uh, due to the COVID crisis and I wanted to do something to <clears throat> really help them. Uh, just because I had help in the past, like so many friends finding job and I know how to do it like easily when you can stand out. So I wanted to show like an actionable guide step by step on how to do that and really help the people. So to do that, the, the title was pretty straightforward. I made it monumental. So in that case, essentially, I, I, I put Lemlist in it, but uh, it was a gift for free. So all the person who were uh, essentially laid off, I offered our solution because it was helping them to find a job and I offered that with a several set of tools for free that we partner with. Um, I made it super actionable. So essentially like um, my goal was for people to create a positive outcomes in their life and really like uh, give them a step-by-step -step process. So how to find companies that are still hiring, how to find the email address of any decision maker on the planet. And finally, how to write compelling email to get tons of interviews and new job on autopilot. Uh, the thing is, I made that uh, article in a very detailed way and I decided to add also a 20 minute step by step tutorial where I show people how I would do it to get jobs and jobs interview. So I go through each process and uh, finally result oriented. So launching uh, essentially a campaign where I'm sharing like uh, the things that I've launched, the results that I got in order for people to really project themselves towards like a, a better future and show them how it works. And finally, the distribution, which I think is uh, more than 50% of the, of the content work. So make sure to have a process for distribution, make sure to reuse your content, recycle, 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 it's important. So use all the different acquisition channel, all the different uh, content distribution channel and uh, connect also with your own ecosystem and understand like macro and micro distribution. Um, thank you everyone. Uh, the game continues. If you want to reach out to me, you can always reach out to me on uh, either via email, guillaume at lemlist.com or directly uh, on uh, LinkedIn. I'm also like uh, very, uh, very present on, uh, on LinkedIn. Did I make it on time, Alex? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think I've lost Alex. Not sure if uh, if people can still uh, can still hear me or not. Um, ah, okay. Well, because Alex is gone, I'm just gonna start beatboxing. Ah, okay, he's back. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I knew that you would start beatboxing, right? <laughs> and see what you would do, see how you would improvise. But yeah. Um, uh, 
luckily I, I saved you there. But um, yeah, thank you uh, for that. And, um, you know, a lot of great shares. Are you going to be uh, sticking around uh, a little bit? Um, uh, maybe I think there's a couple of questions in, in the... Yeah, definitely. I'll go and search the chat uh, just after the event. Yeah, Good, good stuff. And yeah, I mean, totally. I, I love the fact that, you know, asking questions, customer interviews, uh, don't be scared to talk to your customers. I, I think yeah. many of us, you, you know, are. Um, and, and certainly, it, you know, it, it shouldn't be, right? Uh, it shouldn't be the case. So uh, that certainly resonated. Um, and, yeah, I like the, the, the Lemaire content policy. <laughs> the name of your airline for, for a moment, but luckily... It could, it could. <laughs> not, wouldn't be a great business right now, but I guess in, in the future, um, when you sell the company, you might have a private jet and call it Lemaire. Right? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> All right, good stuff. Well, look, um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, we we'll need uh, you to uh, click leave. We'll, we'll speak soon. And uh, you, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll speak later. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Okay, cool. So just before our next speaker, um, just to say we have, we have uh, three more speakers, uh, and then uh, we will have the networking. So stick around for the networking. Uh, to connect with your uh, fellow marketers uh, and SaaS people um, and for your chance to win a, a SaaS stock remote ticket if you are uh, lucky enough to uh, to be paired with, uh, with, with myself. So um, with that, um, let's welcome our next guest who's spoken uh, many a time uh, on the, the SaaS stock stage, um, uh, but mainly in person. This is the first time, uh, you know, speaking uh, online. Um, and somebody that has literally written the book around uh, positioning. Uh, so I'd like to welcome uh, April Dunford uh, to uh, to this uh, SAS Doc session stage. Uh, welcome, uh, April. Let's see. She should be should be joining. And I don't have any beatboxing skills, so uh, certainly I won't be doing. That there we go. I see a whiteboard. Does this work? It works. Oh, that's good. I like it. I like I'm it. Really excited. Now on my end, I get an, ama an amazing delay. I don't know if you do, but I do. There, there, there's there's a little bit of a delay, but I mean we can hear you. Um, so I guess we will we'll roll with it. Um, shall I leave you to it, April, and then uh, see how we get on? Yeah, I, I guess so. Maybe when you leave, the delay will fix itself. So yeah. we'll try it. All right. Thanks, April. I'll be back in 10 minutes. OK. Um, so welcome to my session. I decided I was going to whiteboard this since I'm kind of in uh, uh, at home workshop mode anyway. So we're going to try this and see if it works. My session today is on positioning in a downturn. So um, it, it, as Alex mentioned, I'm a positioning expert. Um, I do a lot of speaking about positioning. Um, so usually when I do a session like this, I have to start by explaining what positioning is. Um, it's really misunderstood. So folks generally confuse positioning with uh, messaging or a tagline or your vision. Um, my personal pet peeve is when people talk about brand positioning. In my opinion, there is Branding and there's positioning, those two things are completely separate. Um, I like to define positioning this way. Positioning defines how your product is the best in the world at delivering something that a well-defined set of customers cares a lot about. That sounds like a bit of a mouthful. That's because positioning consists of a bunch of different component pieces. I have them on the board here. Um, uh, the first is market category. So what is the market that you intend to win? Um, the second is competitive alternatives. Uh, if customers couldn't use your solution, what would they do? Uh, the next is differentiated features. How are you different than these competitive alternatives? Next, we have value. So, so what for customers? What's the value that you can deliver for them? Uh, and the last is ideal customers. So who are you trying to go after? Now, in the work I do, um, it, you know, when you get deep on positioning, the first thing you discover is that I have to actually work through these components in a very particular order. Uh, otherwise, I may end up with positioning that sounds good. It just doesn't necessarily sell. Uh, so the order specifically looks like this. I have to check because I can't see a darn thing. Um, it looks like this. So. 
uh, you have to start with competitive alternatives. Now, people mess this up where they're thinking about their competitors in the wrong way. Often, the competitive alternative is not another company that looks just like you. It's something like, I would do it in Excel or I would hire an intern to do it. But when I really understand the competitive alternatives from the customer's point of view, then I can say, okay, how am I different from that? What are the, my uh, differentiated capabilities or features? Then I can take those features and I can map them to value for customers. That gets me to my value proposition. Once I'm here, I can figure out, well, what customers care the most about that value? That gets me to my ideal customer set. And then lastly is market category. What is the market that I intend to win? Another way to think about that is, what is the context I weave around my offering so that this value is obvious to these people? Now, with that as the preamble, people often ask me, when does positioning need to change? And it does change. We don't get to just set it and forget it. Um, it changes when things in the environment change. So sometimes that's your product. So you add things to your product, you remove things to your product. That means that you're going to have to change the positioning. Sometimes the competitive landscape changes. So you have a big competitor moves in or some big shakeup happens in the competitive landscape. That changes this. Therefore, the rest of the positioning has to change. The last category of things are what we call um, outside forces. So that can include anything from uh, uh, a change in government regulation, for example, might change the priorities that your customers have, and therefore your positioning needs to change because of that. Uh, so this brings me to economic downturn. So we have a big change in the economic landscape. Does that necessarily mean that your positioning should change? And many times the answer is yes. So I'll give you an example of that. During the last economic downturn, or at least the last big one, 2008, I was the vice president of marketing at a company and we sold to mid-sized manufacturers. And our positioning was all around, how could we help manufacturers uh, produce more product and get more output. So our value proposition was all around growth. Like you're a manufacturer, you want to grow, you want to produce more stuff, we're going to help you do that. Then the great financial crisis hit. And suddenly what happened in our customer base was they literally could no longer, they were no longer focused on producing more product because there was decreased demand for what they were producing. So suddenly their priority shifted from, wow, how do we create more to meet demand to how do we deal with the fact that there's reduced demand and now I just need to survive to, to, to this crisis. And in many cases, they were forced to lay people off. Controlling costs became their number one priority. So there's us, we're in there saying, hey, we're gonna help you grow, we're gonna help you push more stuff through the, through the manufacturing plant. Nobody cared all of a sudden. Now we noticed this quickly because we had a customer advisory board. So we brought the advisory board together and, <laughs> and the first thing we learned was, oh my gosh, our value proposition doesn't resonate for these folks anymore. Now, luckily for us, we also had a bunch of functionality um, that was aimed at essentially streamlining operations inside a manufacturing plant. So we, uh, we had a really good value proposition around doing more with less, um, taking a lot of manual stuff out of the processes. So if you had fewer people to get things done, you could still get things done. So we did a shift in our positioning away from, oh, we're gonna help you push more stuff through the manufacturing plant to, hey, we're gonna help you do more than with less. We're gonna help you stretch your dollar. Um, and that worked very well. We had a bit of a, you know, a transition period and then growth for us took off again. So, th so this illustrates how a change in the economy or the outlook can actually change things. Now, the big thing you're looking for is, is there a change in customer priorities? So have you been aligned with a particular priority that suddenly went from number one to number 10 or number one to it's not even on there anymore. And are you going to have to shift your positioning 
in order to um, make sure that you're still relevant to the current priorities that your customer has. Now, at a macro level, uh, when we sell to businesses, we kind of only have two value propositions, like if you think about it. So if your software is for businesses, it's either helping people make money or it's helping people save money. That's kind of all we got. And when the economy looks good, helping people make money is always a stronger value proposition than helping people save money. So, you know, the economy's good, everybody's trying to grow, and we're all like, yeah, yeah, we're gonna help you grow faster, we're gonna help you get more customers, we're gonna help you expand. Now, what happens in an economic downturn is, again, you need to check in on your customers and make sure this is true for them, but what happens is sometimes you'll have your customer base suddenly go from, you know what, growth right now is just impossible. We can't grow now. Even if we wanted to, we can't grow. And our number one priority is suddenly reduce cost. So it, it, when we get into a situation like we have right now, all of a sudden it's bizarro world, everything up is down, and reducing cost suddenly becomes way more important than increasing revenue. If this is true, you as a company are going to have to react to that. So how do you do it? There's two things you got to think about. First of all, you're going to have to check in with your customers. Um, it's not going to necessarily show up on your metrics right away, particularly if you have yearly renewal cycles. You're going to have to have conversations with your customers to get a bead on. Have their priorities changed? Are they shifting where their resources are applied? Are they um, changing um, headcount and where people are applied? And how does that impact your business? And are they making those decisions on a short-term basis or a longer-term basis? Then you're going to have to follow their lead. If it's longer term, then you're going to have to shift longer term too. And then the second thing is this. If you do see that your customers have changed and you suspect that maybe what you need is a change in positioning to go with that, then I would highly suggest that now is a really, really good time to take a step back and do a structured positioning process to evaluate whether or not your positioning still works. Now, most of the companies that I work with, the positioning that they have right now was kind of by accident or default. A lot of people don't take a step back and actually deliberately position their products. Um, so now's a great time to actually look at that and say, we're gonna sit down as an executive team and work through a structured positioning process. I only have 10 minutes, so that's about as far as I can get. If you're interested in how to do a structured positioning process, I have this uh, book here and that will give you uh, more information than you could possibly use on that topic. And that's it. I'm done. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks, April. So the uh, well, one thing there, again, and I think everybody has, has said it so far, is... Uh, you know, uh, the theme of kind of checking in with customers, right, and, and that being yeah. really important. Do you think it's more important in a downturn or is it just always super important to, to do that? Well, I mean, according to me, it's always super important to do it. But I'll tell you right now, when, when you know that there is a potential for big changes, you don't know what the changes are until you check in with those customers and find out. So I've been doing a lot of talking lately about customer advisory boards. And, you know, anybody who had an advisory board set up before this is feeling pretty damn lucky because I've got a set of customers that have committed to giving me feedback and helping me out when things change. Um, but I also think that right now is not a bad time to start a customer advisory board. Your customers are struggling with how to react. They would love to be on a board of their peers to hear what it is that everybody else is doing. It's not a bad time to actually reach out to customers and form that board if you don't have one already. Yeah, absolutely. Great idea. Well, well, thank you so much uh, for sharing that. Um, maybe if you want to drop uh, a link or, uh, in, the, uh, in the chat for your book uh, for people to see uh, more uh, about that if they haven't already bought it, uh, that'd be great. Sure, you can just Google it. Yeah, well, you know, I'm just making it easy for people, but they can Google it. What's the name of it? Obviously Awesome, it's right? It's called Obviously Awesome because it is. Okay, I was going to say, is it any good? But uh, you, you, beat, 
Um, good stuff. All right, April. Thanks so much. We'll uh, we'll, we'll see you at Sastop Remote uh, in, in, in a few weeks' time. Uh, and yeah. Thank you for today. Awesome. Thanks. Bye. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so uh, yeah, trying to get uh, a little bit back on track here, but hopefully you enjoyed that. If you've got any questions for April, either drop them in the in the chat or you'll be able to find her at LinkedIn or in the future at SAS.remote. So uh, I'll welcome our next guest on, uh, uh, and, and that is, uh, I never get the name right, uh, Bill Mekaitis or Mesitis. So I'll have Bill uh, correct me when he uh, jumps on. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we have Bill. How's it going? How did I do with the name? I should know. Hey. Uh, you, you did fine. Uh, whichever one you want. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard them both. It's Lysitis, but don't worry about it. Right. Yeah, okay. You know, I, I, I thought so, but I, I thought <laughs> I'd make my best. Um, well, good stuff, uh, Bill. It's good to see you. Um, we actually spoke at the same conference. Well, you spoke at SASDOC uh, before, I think a couple yeah. of years back. Uh, and we, we also spoke at the same conference in Brazil, which was the, the RD Summit. Um, you spoke in front of 9,000 people. I had about like 300, but <laughs> I mean, I guess everybody got value out of it. So, uh, all good. good stuff. Well, look, I'm, I'm going to leave you uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the floor now, and uh, I'll, I'll be back, uh, you know, in, in 10 minutes or less to let, let us know. Uh, also, um, uh, you know, if you want to take questions as, as well from, yeah. uh, from folks, uh, uh, we'll let you do that. So, over to you, Bill. Yeah, awesome. So first off, it's super excited to be here. Love talking with fellow SaaS entrepreneurs. Uh, my quick background, uh, previously with CMO Zero of Slack, uh, CMO of Zendesk, and uh, SOP Marketing and Salesforce. So kind of seen various companies at different stages, how they've grown. Uh, I thought today I would just try to be practical. I mean, I know we're all kind of, uh, you know, these are crazy times, right? Um, some businesses are counter cyclical and seeing uprise. Some ones are obviously seeing a, a pinch with demand. And, and I thought I'd just talk about like the homepage, right? I mean, this is one of our most important marketing assets. And I was gonna kind of walk you through a story uh, of when I worked with one of the companies that I recently joined the board of. Uh, so they're called Sendoso. And I'm gonna show you their homepage and I'll show you like just practically how we try to adjust our messaging uh, to fit in with the new kind of economic realities. So. Uh, I'm going to shift over. Or I'm going to share my screen real quick here. Uh, and to do that, uh, let's see. Da, da, da. Yes, that sounds good. Cool. Uh, okay. So let's see here. Oh, geez. Okay. So it wants me to uh, quit and open my system preferences. We're not going to do that. But I'm going to talk to you about it. So if anyone wants to multitask, uh, just go to sendoso.com. And so this is a site I joined the, the board of. And what they do is they do corporate gifting, right? And so the idea is like, hey, as you're going through and you're, 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 you're going through these sales processes, uh, they've done a way where right in Salesforce, you can just send uh, corporate gifts to people. They could be, you know, a, a book, you know, Nine Habits of Highly Successful People, or it could just be something like um, a digital gift card. And, you know, this is a huge part of moving deals through. Well, you know, this whole COVID thing hits. And people aren't able to meet people in person anymore. And they've got a great opportunity, right? Because you can send, literally send things like, um, you know, like an Uber Eats gift card, or you can do things that are just going to, a nice reminder, right? Either to help the sales process move through or to help, you know, save your customers. Let them know, hey, you're, you're thinking about them in this uh, time of need. Um, so I went to their homepage and this is like, you know, as the kind of the crisis is going and, you know, they're still kind of using their, their old messaging. Um, and it was in really bold, it was relationships matter. And, you know, I, I think um, during good times, <laughs> you know, it's all about relationships and experiences. And, you know, that sounds great. But what they were running into is all the new deals now were also going through the CFO. <laughs> and the CFO likes to um, talk to a different language, right? Uh, and they also were talking to a lot of their customers and what they're finding is like most salespeople, hey, a lot of my deals are just getting stuck in pipeline, right? Um, and so we went through them. And so if you kind of go to their homepage, uh, we shifted the headline to keep deals moving forward no matter where you're working. And, and I love that for a couple of reasons. One, right? Like, hey, it hit one of salespeople's core pain points um, that, hey, you know, my deal's stuck, right? Like I have all this in pipeline and it's just not moving and it also, no matter where you're working, right, it clearly establishes and anchors that, hey, this is something that 
works in kind of this new virtual sales cycle. Um, the other thing we worked on was uh, the image. So I, I've, I've done a lot of homepages o- over my career. And one thing I've noticed is that uh, us marketers, we love our words. We love to craft the words. And words are great, but <laughs> the visuals, I would argue, are much more important. You know, when I've done a lot of heat map analysis on home pages and you watch video session recordings, people are visual. They tend to look and scan. They, they're not big readers. So, you know, when you uh, sometimes like home pages will have like paragraphs of text, people aren't really reading that, right? They're just scanning through. And the visual on your hero unit, in this case, it's on the right hand side. Um, is really important, right? And and someone has to kind of get what you do. So this is something that, you know, they kind of whipped up pretty quickly, but it was this idea of like, hey, send something personalized. You see the book, Nine Effects of uh, Habits of uh, Successful People to make the connection and close the deal, right? You clearly say, hey, it's a salesperson. They sent this off there. You've anchored, all right, this is what they do. And hey, the value prop is we can keep deals moving forward no matter where you're working. Um, and just that is huge, right? There's still a lot of homepages out there that are using their pre-COVID-19 messaging. And again, I just, I think you have to be relevant. You have to kind of empathize and let people understand like, hey, how your solution works in this new area, right? And when we we, we updated and made this messaging and, you know, all things started going up and to the right. Um, And this is a really important thing. The other thing we talked about is when we went further down, uh, you know, again, they had a really text heavy old homepage. And so, we talked about like, hey, let's put in these key uh, these key ROI drivers. So if you scroll a little bit further down, the next module will see is build pipeline, and increase sales velocity. You see a four times increase in response rate, right? Um, that's important. You know, the next one down, keep your marketing programs relevant and agile. Save 20 hours per campaign. So you're seeing cost savings. You know, you scroll down, demonstrate ROI to key stakeholders. See a 450% return on campaign investment. Um, and again, not really super wordy, you know, where they're, you're doing run-on sentences and multiple paragraphs, just a key headline and then a supporting visual for it. Um, so anyway, like I, I just think like that's something that um, I would consider, you know, as you've gone through, maybe you've already done it, maybe you haven't, you know. Um, obviously, there's a ton of marketing assets, right? The homepage, your sales enablement, um, your first call deck, uh, your demo sequence, um, even your customer stories, right? It's great if you can get a customer story talking about like how your product is relevant in this COVID-19 times and how it's either, you know, brought them money or saved them costs or, you know, even this one, right? Like Sendosa having a customer talk about how they're sending Uber Eats gift cards, you know, and it helps, you know, keep a relationship going and keep the sales moving is really helpful. But ultimately, um, you know, these are just practical things that, that I found, you know, with these homepages, again, just try to reflect the messaging, the headline, focus on the image. It's really important that hero image, you know, don't write a lot of text, um, keep it visual, people scan. Most people will decide if they're gonna go below the fold in five seconds. So if you're gonna spend anywhere, just spend the time above the fold. That's the most important area. Um, and that's stuff that's worked for, for me. And um, in this case, it worked really well for Sendoso. So hopefully that was helpful. I see a lot of uh, uh, chatter in the chat and I'm happy to go through there and answer any other questions that you guys have and I will uh, happily stay on. Hey, Bill, uh, I guess you, you can see me, right? Uh, yes, I can see you. Good, good. Uh, just testing. Yes. So, um, yeah, I mean, if anybody's got any questions uh, for Bill, um, feel free to uh, leave them in the uh, uh, in the chat. I think your 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 point there just around the, the, the messaging, uh, like if you've got the same messaging kind of pre-COVID now, uh, the same messaging now as you did, you know, pre-COVID, um, you know, it may be time to kind of have a look at that. Certainly, if you know if the business has been impacted, and uh, you know, for us, um, a similar kind of story. As we moved our conference, you know, online, uh, we went online with actually the same messaging that we had for our kind of in-person conference for for um, you, you know, and again, kind of pre-COVID. But we realised kind of pretty quickly, actually, you know, the world is is quite different right now. Uh, we do need to, you know, adapt that messaging, and uh, and that's something that we realised a few weeks uh, uh, sort of into it. But uh, okay. have have changed that. So uh, um, so yeah, hopefully uh, many others have, have done the same. Um, yeah, I mean perhaps uh, I, I can't see any uh, sort of clear questions there. But uh, if you're uh, sticking around, Bill. Um, uh, yeah, I'll go on and answer all the questions in the chat. Yeah, awesome, good stuff. Well, thanks so much, and uh, look forward to seeing you in a few weeks. Thanks for having me, Alex. Thanks. Awesome. Good deal.
Okay, cool. We're on to our last talk. Uh, it's 10 minutes more, and then we will uh, be doing the networking. And, and trust me, stick with the networking. It is very cool, very fun. Uh, it's it's uh, a good experience to be paired up with random people uh, who are in different parts of the world, uh, but not only just kind of random people, but uh, in this case, we random marketers, random SaaS people. Um, so uh, good fun to, to have those connections. Um, so here we have our, our, our final speaker, uh, Georgiana uh, Laudi. Welcome. How are you doing? Hi there. How's it going? Yeah, good, good, good. So you're darting in uh, from uh, from Canada. Uh, is I'm it? in Montreal. Yep. Montreal. Very good. Mm -hmm. how, how are things there? It is good. They're great. It's a bit on the cold side, not hot like it is on the West Coast, but uh, warming up. It's nice to finally have nice weather outside so we can get out. That's it. Good, good, good. So we are, or you will be talking about how to understand customers and make better decisions when all bets are off. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll leave you with that and I'll be back uh, in 10 minutes. Uh, so uh, over to you. Okay, I am going to do my absolute best to stay on time here because I know we're over time. Um, I don't have any slides. I just have a couple of notes. When I ran through this this morning, I hit like the 15 minute mark, but then at one time I did do it at 10 minutes. So I'm going to do my best to blaze through this as quickly as I can. Um, I'm going to be focused uh, a little bit more on the customer understanding side of things. So uh, basically getting your team what they need, the information that they need to make uh, decisions uh, as, as sorry, the information that they need as quickly as possible so that they can make decisions and address the needs of either your new customers that you're attracting to right now or your existing customers that may have slightly different uh, problems. So I've been talking to a lot of uh, SaaS founders, marketers, uh, product managers, heads of growth, things like that. Every single one of the SaaS companies that I've spoken to in the last two months have fallen into three sort of scenarios. There is a total sort of famine situation on one side, which is where signups and sales have stopped altogether. These are uh, companies typically that are, um, you know, developing software for uh, industries like healthcare or schools or in person. So they are experiencing a total sort of famine situation. Opposite side of the spectrum is a feast situation. So these are the companies that are Demand has accelerated uh, beyond their capacity. Uh, these are, I mean, the software like we're using right now. So online collaboration, virtual events, video conferencing, uh, companies like that, which are um, the demand has sort of exceeded what the team was set up to sort of address. And then there's, of course, those of us who fall into the middle where it's sort of a, a near famine situation is what I've been seeing is where signups have slowed, uh, onboarding is harder than it was before, and customers who may not have been uh, considered at risk before this happened are now starting to cancel. Uh, a lot of the companies in there are surveying SMB markets. So I did put a poll in, uh, there was a poll posted and I was wondering uh, just to get a sort of sense of where everybody is at here so that I can sort of dive into that area because I could go down any one of these paths, um, but with the limited time, obviously I'm not going to be able to do that. So if you could fill out that poll, that would be great. And then if there's some way for me to see the responses, that would be awesome. I don't know how to do that. Uh, so I'm just going to let that happen while I continue going. So depending on which of these situations that you're in, what you do next is going to be dramatically impacted, obviously. I'm so glad that April spoke before me because uh, she did a lot of heavy lifting. In fact, with all the companies that I work with, I highly recommend that they read her book uh, because it is really critical to understand all the implications of positioning in, a, in an environment where all bets are off. So unfortunately, everything that you knew about your customers in February uh, is no longer true. Uh, maybe not everything you knew about them, but much about what you knew about them is no longer true. And there's sort of this uh, feeling right now that I'm hearing or this assumption that everybody needs to move really, really fast and they need to rely on their gut and they just need to push forward and, um, you know, the, the sense of urgency is a bit overwhelming. And while I can completely empathize with that sense of urgency, um, I do want to caution uh, making decisions too quickly or, um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to make sure that I can see the chat just in case that poll, those poll numbers came in over there. So I just I want to caution 
Um, though I can understand that sense of urgency, I don't want you guys thinking that you can't learn from your customers right now because you absolutely can. So um, marketers, I think, and everybody inside of companies right now are in a really unique position to and should really start putting on at least a lightweight researcher's hat to, um, you know, think, start thinking in terms of what can we learn from our customers right now. Um, there is definitely a sink or swim situation happening right now. It's starting to equalize a bit, thank God, but uh, there's a lot of companies that are messing this up and they're doing things like blanket discounting or opportunistic sales and marketing tactics that are not landing very well. What I've seen actually mostly is very well-intentioned, but kind of lazy marketing that is landing badly. And that's because we are trying to sort of make it easier for the people who had the problem we solved before this crisis, making it easier for them to make a purchase decision or, or to decide to evaluate our product when in fact their problem has has changed. So it can come across as a bit disingenuous, unfortunately. So we have an opportunity here to, uh, and it's very apropos, but we have an opportunity to pause um, and to uh, sort of reevaluate what we're doing. And I, I, I do want to say that I think a lot of people have realized this by now. This crisis is not going anywhere. There is no magic day in six weeks from now or two weeks from now where everything's everything's going to go back to normal. Um, there is going to be a new normal that we are all solving for. And I think that very much warrants taking a bit of a step back to reevaluate whether or not the strategies that we're using to attract people to us, the messaging that we're using uh, to help resonate with them and the ways that we are you know, trying to help them learn how to adopt our product and stay engaged uh, with our product does actually need to change. So I'm gonna dive into the, I don't see any poll results just yet. Let me just take a look. So I'm not seeing that, but what I, what I will do is um, I will focus on the situation in the middle. So that near famine situation. So you've been experiencing maybe slowed or in inconsistent growth since about mid-March uh, or maybe early March, depending on where you are. Uh, so the first and foremost thing that I hope that you did in March was to sort of reevaluate and and sort of analyze all of the programs that you had running. So all of the marketing strategy, you know, your 2020 marketing strategy, Hold it to the side for a second and look at the things that you have currently running, all the ads you have running, uh, your content calendar headed up, uh, any nurture campaigns or anything that was auto triggered, maybe your product onboarding, things like that. Um, are those things doing more harm than they are good? If they're doing more good than they are harm, great. Um, but just make sure to take a bit of stock on where you might be shooting yourself in the foot or uh, sticking your foot in your mouth. Um, so definitely try to uh, avoid that. So I'm going to assume that everybody's done that because we are, oh, I'm seeing the breakdown now. Total famine, 17%. Uh, 63, sorry, customers are canceling. Okay, so it looks like 63% of you are in that the category that I'm describing, which is like sort of, you know, new signups have slowed, uh, onboarding is harder to do, and some ca customers are canceling. So that's where I'm, I'm zoomed into right now. So operating under the assumption that you have evaluated whether or not any of your current programs that you were running in March are actually doing more harm than they are good, now is the time to focus on two things stopping the bleeding and also, uh, you know, and in stopping the bleeding, doing some research and talking to some customers. And then the other thing that you will need to do definitely is to take that 30,000 foot view and look at, wow, is the change in our customers and the change in the pro problem that we solve uh, significant enough that we really do need to do a significant repositioning, which I think in many, many cases, repositioning is in order. You may also need to or might want to consider making some updates to your product. I realize this isn't an area of influence typically uh, for marketers, but as a business, you might want to be thinking about uh, some product updates, even if only slight, uh, potentially evaluating your value metric and how what you base your pricing on. I'm not saying lowering your pricing, but potentially your value metric might need to change. And then the more interesting one, I'm sure for this group would be potentially thinking about uh, new acquisition strategies. I'm seeing a lot of companies, uh, I, basically toying with the idea of using freemium, uh, developing actively a freemium model, 
or uh, having recently just deployed a, a, a freemium model, there are a lot of implications. That is a big, big decision to undertake as a business. And the implications, there are downstream implications to that. For instance, your onboarding will need to um, accommodate a low touch or self-serve, which uh, a lot of companies are not equipped for without doing some serious customer research. So you may be in a situation, you, you should be doing those two things, stopping the bleeding or that leak in the bucket or whatever you know analogy you prefer. Uh, and then of course, taking a sort of higher level uh, strategic look at the entire um, product strategy as a whole. So in stopping the bleeding, it, essentially what that means is you're going to want to zoom into the area of your customer journey or your customer experience that it, you're, you're having the, the most challenges with. And so as marketers, we're in a really unique position to be able to support the company, um, whether or not it's customer success or product marketing or sales, we're really in a good position to be able to support the, the company with a communication layer um, that is um, relatively easy for us to implement, maybe in, a, in an email uh, you know, campaigns or email program that we can run or in a customer experience layer inside of our product. So the um, areas, the, the places to look for in that customer journey from experiencing the problem that you solve to landing on your website and really people evaluating whether or not your product is going to be the right solution for them, how they evaluate your product, how they make a decision about uh, whether or not it's going to work for them, who are the people that are involved, what do they need to see in the product, how does you know continuous value, uh, what does continuous value look like for them and retention and so on. So uh, knowing which of those areas you are having the most amount of pain or the biggest leak in your bucket is going to show you where to point to first. So I'm just going to go down them quickly, as quickly as I can, because I know we are over time. Uh, so for uh, anybody, if, if the first place that we could start obviously is in market research, but I'm going to start at website. So anybody that is currently seeking a solution like yours, I mean, you should always be running a survey on your website, but now is more important than ever. You can add a single question survey to your website that is, how can we make this page better? If Is there anything that is missing? Or um, what, if anything, stopped you from taking action today? That will give you a lot of insight into, has the use case that people are coming to uh, you for changed? Uh, that'll give you some early indications that they might not be ready to make a purchase, but they are seeking a solution that's similar to yours. So you can learn a lot from them. Anybody who has recently signed up for your product, I know there might not be droves of them if this is where you're impacted the most, but even if you have just a couple dozen customers who have decided to sign up for your product and evaluate your product in the last few weeks, weeks or few, uh, well, not few months, but few weeks, um, send them an email with a single question. That is, we understand that life has changed for our customers. What caused you to seek a solution like ours? Uh, one question in an email, very simple to do. You don't have to get fancy with automations. Just find the people who have recently signed up for your product and email them one-on-one. -on -one. If you get a response and you see a use case that you're not accustomed to seeing, then um, get these people on the phone. You need to talk to them. So offer to, uh, to walk them through the product, especially if it's a use case that hasn't been seen before. Your current onboarding might not do its job. So get them on a call, record those calls, transcribe those calls. Uh, similarly, for newly activated customers, so anybody who has recently begun to use your product and has begun paying for your product recently, email them and ask, that, and ask them, what can be you or made you feel confident that our product was going to be the right one for you. Get them on a call. Similarly, anybody who replies to that, get them on a call, record and transcribe that call. Going down the list really quickly here. Anybody who is newly engaged, so those who have um, been maybe customers for a little while, but who recently upped the way they use your product or upped how much they use your product. These people are so, so valuable to you. You need to get them on a call. Same thing send them an email, you know, look at these people who've started to use your product, in what ways are they using it, in what ways are they not using it, and then send them an email and get them on a call, again, record, transcribe. And then uh, the last group that I will focus on in terms of customers and how to learn from them is recently canceled customers. So these are customers who have either, maybe they were longtime customers, again, they weren't at risk in February, but then they canceled all of a sudden, or those newer customers who just could not make your product work for them. So you're going to email them with one question again and say, you know, we're sorry that you didn't love it, what made you cancel? Groove HQ sees an average of 19% response rate on this type of email. Uh, that is a, a fantastic response rate for if somebody who's canceled. If you get a reply, if you were lucky enough to get a reply to these, again, they're so, so valuable. 
offer to compensate them for their time. Don't I, I, these fifty you know dollar Amazon gift cards are nice and all, but uh, do offer to compensate them for their time. They are so so valuable to right to you right now. I want to make one caution with these questions before I go, and that is don't fall in love with the first customer problem. Do run enough of these calls so that you do start to see a pattern. It's very tempting to like fall in love with the next problem to solve. Um, but I would recommend running at least 10 to 12 of these for each of these questions so that you can get to a sort of level of confidence to develop a really good hypothesis for how you can help your company address these customers at the various stages of your customer journey. Amazing. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yeah, amazing how much you can cram into uh, into ten minutes. We'll give you a bit longer, uh, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that was a, that was a very very fast. I realized. No, 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 it's good. Uh, a lot, lot, lot of information. And just for for everybody tonight. I mean, we 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 are recording this, uh, and we will be sharing the videos. Uh, with everyone uh, uh if you want to uh, sort of watch these back and uh, but I, I think yeah um, so many amazing tips there and again i think you know the customers sort of being at the at the center of this and i love sort of like just emailing them one-on-one -on -one, uh you, you know after they've sort of purchased and, and finding out and again how many people kind of do that it probably doesn't happen right often enough um but uh, but yes yeah, thank you so much uh georgiana we'll see you at sasco remote in a in a few weeks yeah. time and um thanks, yeah, everyone. thanks again Okay, cool. All right, so we are uh, done with the content. Thank you, everybody, for, for sticking around with that. Hopefully, uh, you learned a lot of, uh, that you can apply uh, to your business and, uh, and yourself for the right now. Um, we are going to jump into the networking. Uh, before we do, uh, just a couple of things, uh, obviously, saying thank you. Uh, when we send out the survey, please, um, uh, if you can, uh, would you respond to the survey? Just to uh, you know, give us a bit of feedback on what we can do to you know continue to improve uh, the SaaS sessions and what sort of topics that you'd like to hear about. Uh, a couple of quick plugs tomorrow. Uh, if you're not already involved, and certainly if you're European based, we are running SaaS Local Europe, uh, which is the, the really the first sort of conference organised by the, the European SaaS community for the European SaaS community. So we'll have about a thousand. Uh, plus uh, attendees for that event, uh, which is running from, I think, sort of 3 p.m. Uh, or 4 p.m. sort of British time uh, until uh, sort of 6 p.m. So it's a short event, uh, but a lot of content, uh, valuable content and community-driven content there. Uh, and, of course, check out sasdoc.com forward slash uh, uh, remote uh, for sasdoc remote. And uh, use you can use the uh, discount code sasdoc sessions to get 20% off. So with that, um, wrapping up, thanks everybody. Let's go to networking. Uh, if you pair with me, you get a free ticket to uh, Staff Remote and uh, so we'll speak to you uh, in a minute.